And in this episode, we're heading deep into the Australian bush and a vast area of outback New South Wales, as seen through the eyes of the farmer and historian, Eric Rolls. I knew Eric Rolls real well. Real well, I knew Eric, yeah. I used to take him out and show him places in the Pilikapora. Yeah, well, he was a bit mad on all birds and everything like that. <laughs> Insects. But he's a very strange person. Very. The Pelliga Scrub, as it's often called, is loosely bordered by the towns of Narrabri, Coonabarabran and Baradine. Even the names sound hot and dry, don't you think? Well, you may know the Pelliga as the site of an ongoing coal seam gas dispute, but it's also the subject of Eric Rolls's poetic and groundbreaking history, A Million Wild Acres. So let's join producer Nicole Steinke now for a journey inside the Pelliga and the writing of that story. So you never knew what you're going to find with Eric, you know, it was, um, he was different. <laughs> he used to disappear for months and go down to the Mitchell Library. Didn't matter what was happening on the farm, he just took off and away he went. This is the story of Eric Rolls, a writer who was born a farmer. This is the sort of thing that Eric, he spent hours and hours and hours lying down watching termites in the Pilligan. He was mad on research. Eric wrote Australia's first true environmental history, A Million Wild Acres. Swashbuckling and bold, it arose from his lifetime struggle between poetry and the land. And readers from the poet Les Murray to semi-literate farmers wrote to tell him how much it meant to them to read something that grew directly from the soil. This is how that history opens. It's as long as the good road between Narrabri and Coonabarabin that runs down the middle of it. It's as wide as the narrow track stays out for timber trucks between Barnbar and Paradine. It's busy with trees, with animals and with men. It's lonely and beautiful. It's a million wild acres. There's no other forest like it. Eric was, yes, a farmer, but he was, above all, a poet. And I think part of what makes the book magnificent is the way in which he turns this poetic vision into a hundreds-of-pages saga in prose. This is Tom Griffiths. Professor of History at the Australian National University. He reflects on the significance of Eric Rolls in his recent book, The Art of Time Travel, Historians and Their Craft. It combines the detail of this wondrous but very confined place, really. It's one place on the earth, but it makes a story about the human condition from that place. You can't love anything unless you understand it. It simply exasperates, anything exasperates me if I don't understand it. I have to know, learn everything I can about it. That's a fascination. I think I've got a decidedly superior yellow-footed marsupial moth. Ooh, he's lively. And he's bigger than usual. And um, I think he's a male, but I can't see yet. Can't see his testicles for dog biscuits. Eric Rolls in 1983. He died in 2007, aged 84. Eric was an unusual man. Farmer, poet, self-taught naturalist and historian. His great book, A Million Wild Acres, was published in 1981. It's the story of the growth of a forest and all that's part of it. Human, insect, soil and animals. It turned Australia's thinking about its forests inside out and made Eric almost as many enemies as friends. 
I have shown no concern for those who are ashamed of their ancestors. It is a foolish shame. The tormented community generated its own men. Some hard gobbets indeed were thrown up. Those attracted later as settlers were of the same type. Capable, adventurous and extraordinarily adaptable. Difficult, crude, vigorous, dishonest, selfish, violent. They developed Australia. No gentleman ever succeeds in doing much. This book was not written by a gentle man. I'm Ray Tassel and I was mail person for the Pilliga. 105, I think, kilometres was my mail run and 28 gates. You had to open them all, get out and close them, whether there were snakes hanging on them or not. <laughs> and Eric was the third last house. And he'd rush out to me with a parcel from the Million Wild Acres, chapter by chapter. Or he'd sing out, hang on Ray, I haven't finished yet. And I'd sit on the veranda and make myself a coffee while he finished the chapter so I could rush it to town and post it. He wasn't the best looking man in the world by a long shot. He was tall, angular, gangly, but he had something that glowed inside him for all that. He liked his opinion. I don't know whether you were allowed one quite often, <laughs> but he was a good scout all the same. He wouldn't have done you any harm, Eric Rowell. I've got him and he's got me. Very sharp, carnivorous teeth. They're not a, they're not a rodent, they're a marsupial. He doesn't want to let go, so that keeps He quiet. has so many characters in this book whether they're human or animal or insect or plants. But one of the most interesting characters is the white cypress pine. Can you tell me about it? Ah, the white cypress pine, the old greys. The pines are the heart of his story. The pines are the trees whose biographies he's trying to tell, that these forests in his part of Australia are not primeval forests, but, in fact, forests that have grown out of the experience of European settlement. They've become denser because of European settlement, because of the loss of Aboriginal fire stick farming and many other environmental influences. They have grown to a density and excitement and concentration that they didn't perhaps have earlier. <coughs> Eric set out on a quest to uncover the history of his forest. In telling the history of the Pilliga, he went back to the forest's beginning, when what's now a million acres of dense, dry scrub was open grasslands with occasional great trees. Eric Rolls uncovered a story of conflict and colonization, at a time when few had heard it, of how the Aboriginal people who'd been maintaining that open countryside through use of fire were violently forced off their land. From the beginning of settlement, there was an astonishingly close relationship with the Aborigines. It was rare for a white man to be killed by unknowns. When a shepherd in a lonely hut was speared, if he saw the man who threw it, he knew him by a name. And when stockmen rode out to shoot Aborigines in retaliation, they counted the dead by name but the names they called them were cursory and degrading. Bobby, Saturday, Sunday, King Billy. Most Europeans could not be bothered learning to pronounce Aboriginal words, and in choosing names for Aboriginal acquaintances, they took less trouble than teamsters in naming their work bullocks. A Million Wild Acres was published in 1981, the same year as Henry Reynolds' The Other Side of the Frontier. These stories of brutality on the frontier were confronting to many Australians. But that was only part of the challenge Eric Rolls was presenting to contemporary Australia, and not the part that provoked the most hostility. He was also challenging the pedigree of our inland forests. Most weren't primeval, he wrote. His great forest had grown up thanks to European land grabs. With the Aboriginal people forced off their land, the pines took over. The white cypress pines are neither cypress nor pines. They're a native conifer 
that given the right conditions, runs wild like any weed. The result was the Pilliga scrub. Cypress pine thickets. I can show you areas in the Pilliga where the cypress pine is about that far apart. So close you can't pass. Oh, you could walk through it. David Johnston, neighbour and friend of Eric Rolls. David's 88 and a dedicated bird watcher. His wife came from one of the old Pilliga timber families that lived deep in the forest. I liked the way Eric thought. My wife's grandfather, oh, 50 odd years ago, said to me, you could gallop a horse through the Pilliga on a moonlight night nearly anywhere. He said you couldn't walk a horse through it now. And he was shepherding sheep in the Pilliga in the late 1800s. And uh, he was actually there when the big rain came and the Pilliga changed. It changed almost overnight. He said the cypress pine came up as thick as a crop of wheat and put us off our runs. And that was the late 1800s. But it didn't matter how many oral testimonies Eric quoted, telling of the change from open grasslands to a dense forest of cypress pine, or how many accounts of explorers and colonial settlers he cited. Early 1980s conservationists were furious at his claims that not all forests existed before colonization. Many of them still are. Tom Griffiths. The context was the 1970s. This is the whole decade in which Eric is writing this book. The 1970s were a time when the chief forest conservation debates were about rainforests. There was the Terania Creek protests in the late 1970s. There was Lake Pedder in southwest wilderness of Tasmania. These are forests that put the emphasis on an old Gondwanan type of rainforest coming under threat. Whereas Eric lives in a drier, wooded landscape and his forest story is very different. And indeed, his story is a far more general story about Australia than is the rainforest story. So he's, he's teaching us to think in more complex, discriminating ways about forest history but it could easily be simplified and misrepresented as sort of anti-conservationist. It was and still is. For conservationists, Eric Roll's thesis was dangerous. And for some who hadn't read the book, only excerpts trickily used by the timber industry to justify logging of all forests, it was sacrilegious. Eric was explicit in A Million Wild Acres that he was not writing about the rainforests or the mountain ash forests of Victoria. They were primeval. He was writing about the Pilliga. The small town of Baradine, the neat villages of Canabri and Wabagar exist only for the sleeper cutting and the sawmills. At night, fires glow in the round, rough, high-walled, corrugated iron sawdust pits. Day and night, the aromatic smell of burning resin drifts about. I knew Eric Rolls real well. Real well, I knew Eric, yeah. I used to take him out and show him places in the Pilliga Forest. Yeah, well, he was a bit mad on all birds and everything like that. <laughs> Insects, but he's a very strange person. Eric. This is Ron Cutts. He spent years catching wild brumbies and selling them for dog meat. Catching brumbies out of the forest all my life. I'd go away around here, then I'd come back catching brumbies and running brumbies. And you had to know where every waterhole was in the bush. Ride night and day to find every waterhole so you could build you out on the main hole and fend the other ones in. You can find Ron in the index of a million wild acres. He was one of many people who told Eric about life in the forest. Running the wild horses, driving them at the gallop into winged yards was a chancy and dangerous occupation. Only the hardest riders enjoyed it. A surer way of taking the horses was to build a trap yard on one water, then fence off other waters in the area during a hot dry spell. 
perishing the horses, it was termed. The horses knew that entrance was a trap. They padded around the other fenced-off waters night after night, looking for ways over or under. They ignored the entrance to the trap yard and investigated the bottom rail on their knees. They resisted until they were staring-eyed and hollow-flanked. Then they filed through the entrance. Eric was a writer and a farmer. The letters to his editor, publisher and agent, written during the long years it took him to complete a million wild acres, reveal the constant battle between words and acres. But he had help on both fronts. His wife, Joan, his longtime neighbours in Bogabri, east of the Pilliga, watched with some amusement and admiration for Joan, as Eric would disappear to the Mitchell Library in Sydney, or across the country, pursuing his next research lead. Okay. Yeah, Joan had to look after it, organise the man and um, <laughs> organise everything, whether it was shearing or sewing, Joan had to do all that. But didn't worry her. She, uh, she's one of these ladies who are very laid back. We thought, well, she have to be to put up with Eric. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sometimes he'd get the inspiration. He said, I've got the inspiration. And he'd disappear into his room and he'd stay there for days. She would take a meal, knock on the door. I don't need eating. I don't need food. I'm busy. So you sit in there and he'd write for days. Wouldn't have a cup of coffee, wouldn't have a cup of tea or anything. He'd just sit there. And the inspiration's gone. Oh, I better go back to work now. I love the waking up to the smells of earth. They're always changing. And the sounds and the sounds of earth. And the birds, where well, all the time I'm writing them, often a blue wren comes and takes insects off the gauze. Nine brown quail fussick around under the rosemary. Spotted bowbird, two or three metres away, barks like a fox. It's a good place to ride. You might not be really hearing them, you're concentrating so hard. You, But they're just there. You're aware enough that they're there. A Million Wild Acres was a hugely popular book. And more than 35 years later, it continues to sell. In the writing of history, the passive tense is lazy. Eric is never lazy. He must find out who did what, when and where. And he'll tell you that. And it's this cascade of detail that becomes utterly fascinating. A yearly marvel is the pollination of the pines. The spring of 1973 amazed men who had seen 80 years of pine flowering. In the early morning, thousands of trees exploded together. Dense clouds rolled up from the forest. If one is near a pine, when all the cones burst together, one hears a crack like a pistol shot. The branches recoil and the tree shivers. One does not expect a tree to move in passion. Eric doesn't just make a general statement, he tells it with personal detail. So he doesn't just say that introduced dense weeds have overwhelmed native flora. He tells you that he's actually gone into his paddocks and crawled around and counted the number of native grasses and flora that are there and found them to be totally overwhelmed by all of the weeds. And you get a sense of this scholar on his knees in his paddock, trying to make sense of history. This was not an approach that all his new neighbours understood or approved of when Eric and Joan sold their original farm near the eastern boundary of the forest of Bogabri and moved to the southwestern edge, close to Baradine. Judith Hadfield was collecting material for a local history herself when by chance she and her husband sold their farm to Eric and Joan. I first met Eric when he came out to look at our property, which was for sale. Eric had the money. We said goodbye, Cumberdean, and moved to town. 
quite a pleasant house, the homestead. And first thing he did, all the floors were covered with linoleum or carpet, but he pulled it all up. He wanted board floors, but he didn't polish it or anything. He just wanted natural board floors. All cypress pine, the whole building was cypress pine. He didn't want anything contaminating it. And so far as the farm was concerned, uh, he wasn't a farmer in the sense that my husband was a farmer. There was an area almost in the middle of the place where some kind of clover, which was currently very fashionable among farmers at the time, and he was cultivating a piece of it, my husband. And when we went out there for a drive, you know, six weeks or something later, Eric had fenced it all off and he was killing it and trying to bring back the natural grasses and what have you which didn't seem to be quite the right thing according to the current attitude among farmers. But no, he, he was different, totally different. The forests increased my wonder. And I thought I had all the wonder I could contain. I took water out to one of the rock ferns that I'd been told rejuvenated miraculously after a shower of rain. And so they do. Five minutes after I threw a bucket of water on a fern, one moss that looks like little flat oval leaves was alive everywhere the water had run. Twenty minutes later, other mosses had sent out new growth six millimetres long. I went back in the afternoon for another look. The ground was even greener with another species all around the fern. I'd spent six years writing a book about this forest and here was something new to me. There's no end to what it can show you. All you have to do is look. You're talking about trees, termites, black wasps. Because there was no comfort in that house. That that's the way they were. Comforts didn't seem to be important. Eric, I don't know whether he had any heating or cooling or anything in his room where he sat and did all his writing. But they didn't seem to care about that. But food was important and the way of life was important. Simple things like the smell of burning leaves in the house, those sort of things were important. And uh, the things that happened outside his window were important. The ants were important, little things. And that's what I liked about Eric. I felt as one with him in many ways. When Joan became ill, she and Eric were deep in research for his massive history of the Chinese in Australia. After her death, he advertised for a research assistant, and so met Elaine Van Kempen. Eventually, she became his wife. Eric had two long and happy marriages. After his death in 2007, Elaine arranged for the republication of A Million Wild Acres, including essays by Tom Griffiths and Les Murray. The book remains in print. You've been listening to Eric Rolls and The Pilliger. The producer was Nicole Steinke and the sound engineer was Russell Stapleton. Excerpts from A Million Wild Acres were read by William Zappa. I'm Kirsty Melville. This has been Earshot. See you next time.